Hello and welcome to the Brave New Weed podcast. And now here's your host, Joe Dolce. Matthew, I'm talking to you from San Francisco this week. Still out enjoying the California sun, I see. California has been glorious. I've met amazing people again, more amazing people in the cannabis industry. We'll be we'll be having one of them on the show tonight and another one um, on another episode in the near future. I met a um, an herbalist who mixes cannabinoids into herbal tinctures to make some pretty powerful potions. Oh, um, wow. That's, you know, that's sort of on the lines of what I've been, you know, kicking around uh, with you for quite a while of, of mixing herbs with, uh, with you know, cannabis to, to make a, yeah, a cigarette type thing. Yeah, it's very interesting. And his name is Mitchell Thompson. He's, he's one of the original founders of a dispensary here called Peace in Medicine, which is one of the earliest dispensaries in California. So we actually sat down uh, when I was touring Northern California and we will be bringing you, we'll, you'll be hearing that episode in the next couple of, in the next couple of weeks. Excellent. So it's, it's really interesting what he's been doing. And I think it's going to be the future. I think, you know, wellness and cannabis is a big, big topic and wellness is a big, big industry. And I think that's the kind of mix that cannabis does really well in. Mm-hmm. So um, what's the news? I've been in California, so I've been a little out of it. I've been working. I'm like, squirreled away in the countryside. Tell me what's been going on. <laughs> sure. Well, let's talk about a couple of things. Um, first up, from the big national level, uh, Forbes is reporting on a, on a BuzzFeed article that secretly the Trump administration has been assembling a team of federal agency leaders to promote and uh, collect the most negative stories and trends that they can find about cannabis here in the United States. Well, those of us who are students of history know that this is really nothing new. This is what the, the government has been doing for 80 some odd years. Yeah, it's, it's just, I think, uh, interesting to note that uh, in this sort of sea change of positivity happening here in the United States and, and really all around the world as we learn more about it, uh, that Trump, in and amongst all of his other troubles, has carved some time out to like rally the troops and circle the wagons. So it still makes no sense to me that this guy who's so in, invested in making America great again, his version of great, um, is ignoring the incredible business that that, that cannabis has to, to offer us. And so much business at that. The only new American industry in the last 30 years. In, in fact, it speaks uh, well to another news story uh, that I'd like to bring up to you, which is we have reached the point where the first full year of uh, Nevada having a legal recreational program for marijuana has, uh, the numbers have been published. The numbers came out. Uh, so their tax revenue for a full year has come in and it is 140% the expectation that they had set out for themselves. So how much does that yield in dollars? I think it was somewhere near $75 million in tax revenue. Uh, it really is. Uh, dispensaries in the state sold $424.9 million worth of marijuana for the year. Uh, and when you look at how that is uh, broken out in taxes, it's $42.5 million uh, on the 10% retail tax, so that's sold to the people, and 15% retail, uh, retail tax on uh, on wholesale purchases for vendors, put it at $27.3 million, so the total is in fact $69.8 million in, 70 million. in and tax in Nevada. Revenue. And in Nevada, that money is going largely to education, right? To the school districts. Yeah, absolutely. Correct? They have a they have a fund that is uh, the state funds for schools, local and public schools all over, and that uh, that ten percent retail tax and that fifteen percent wholesale tax go directly into those coffers. So all that money ends up back in Nevada schools. Fantastic, fantastic. I mean, I don't think the point of legal cannabis is only tax revenue, but when you look at it, it's a pretty undeniable perk. And, you know, it's not huge numbers either. You're talking about a 10% retail tax. Uh, that's comparable to, like, luxury taxes on alcohol, 15% um, wholesale tax. That's very similar to the to the cigarette, the tobacco stamp taxes in some states. So, 
you're not really jacking up a price here and it's a minuscule amount when you're talking about you know that 60 70 million dollars is nothing compared to the 430 million dollars that was pumped into the state economy those are mom and pop shops those are local growers and producers packagers truck drivers that are all reaping the benefits of this huge boon in uh, in a new market that the Trump administration <laughs> wants to oh, yeah. somehow malign. Okay, I, you know I don't want to talk about Trump this week. I'm sick of him. <laughs> what um, <laughs> what else is happening? <laughs> well, uh, you know, we spoke last uh, last episode about the race to produce uh, the first cannabis breathalyzer. And yeah, uh, right. a couple of different companies and a lot of people, uh, in, anytime you see about this and uh, impaired driving and sort of like the, the good news versus bad news of legal cannabis, um, that's a big part of it. And one of the regular battlegrounds for this is, of course, the state of Colorado. Now, all year this year, we've been talking about different studies, uh, seeing different studies about how, oh, traffic accidents after legalization of cannabis in Colorado are way up. And then it's like, well, actually, traffic accidents reported to the police are down and people are just dealing directly with their insurance companies. So insurance claims are up, but accidents are down. So the overall number of traffic deaths that involve drivers who tested positive for marijuana rose by 11 percent from 2016 to 2017. However, that's a manipulated statistic because the truth is these are alcohol-related accidents that also the driver tests positive for marijuana. If you remove the alcohol from the equation, drivers who are specifically only smoking cannabis and then getting behind the wheel of a car and getting involved in a fatal accident, that number has dropped by, by more than a third. Yeah, it, it's just a dispelling. I mean, the, the fact of the statistics are this fear that comes out of Colorado of stoned drivers uh, killing a lot of people because they can say, oh, well, fatalities are up, fatalities are up. That's not actually true because the fatalities involving stone drivers are actually down. You know, in this, especially moving forward, if this Trump uh, organization of negative spin on cannabis is going to be true, we really need to be looking at statistics and really understanding what these statistics are showing us. Because if the same report can say, yes, deaths are going up and yes, deaths are going down, we really need to know what we're talking about and yep. being solid with our statistics. Okay. Um, last last bit of news, Joe. I know that that's a little heady uh, stuff there, manipulating statistics. This one's not heady at all. This is pretty straightforward. Uh, I, I'm sure you're familiar with the famous Lloyd's of London. The insurance company. Yeah, that deals with uh, things like uh, very high volume investment for venture capitalists and, and even gets into some weird things. I, I think that they uh, at one point insured Mariah Carey's voice and potentially Kim Kardashian's derriere. Yes. Well... Lloyd's of London has issued a statement to its uh, members that it will, in fact, insure and underwrite investments made into Canada's emerging cannabis market. Well, that's only smart, isn't it? I mean, why on earth well, wouldn't they? <laughs> I, I think so. It, there's, of course, the big concern about you know uh, money laundering and laws. Uh, the UK has a specific law about turning profits off of money that comes from crime and whether or not cannabis sales in, in Canada would be involved, uh, would be considered illegal activity in the UK. But apparently they've talked to their lawyers and it's all A-OK. -okay. So if you are one of those, I don't know, less than 100 people that is insured by Lloyds of London for your investments, uh, Canada is now an open market for you. Bravo. Thank you, Matthew. Joe and I will continue to publish every episode of the Brave New Weed podcast for free for you, our listeners. But we could always use your support. If you've got a little extra change rattling around in your pocket, you can cruise over to patreon.com slash brave new weed and become a supporter of the show. Everything that you'd pledge to support helps us to increase the guests that we can have on the show, even eventually the frequency of the show. And we have a great set of rewards out there, including copies of Joe's book, invites to special events that we will do in New York City, all sorts of fun things. So if you're enjoying the podcast and you would like to support us, visit patreon.com slash brave new weed today. So this week... I got really lucky this week. I ran into Jason Silva on Twitter. Jason Silva 
is a character who I, I've been watching and following for several years now. He's I would call him a wonder junkie. He travels the world talking about really how we can put more awe, more wonder, more surprise into our lives. And I have always found this to be a welcome antidote to data-driven society that we seem to be approaching more and more. The thing about Jason is he's a bit of a mystery. I, I didn't know much about him. Um, he, he, as I said, he travels the world giving these presentations. Um, he makes amazing videos that are smash cut edited and they've been called the video version of an LSD trip. And I would agree with that. If you haven't seen with them, you can check them out on YouTube. Um, and somehow Jason and I, our schedules managed to collide and we met up in the offices of Meadow which is a company that I love that's also building the most advanced software to power the cannabis industry. Now, it, it turns out in our conversation, Jason told me that he happens to be a huge cannabis enthusiast. But interestingly, he doesn't use it every day. Um, and we didn't even partake together. But what he likes to do instead is engineer his cannabis adventures and, and use it really sparingly and only under cer certain circumstances. He wants to keep it special. So I think this, this, this interview will tell you how Jason Silva uses cannabis as his wonder drug um, and as a way of adding a little more awe and wonder into his everyday life as well. Check it out. We're live. You're live, man. Jason, Live. it's really nice for you to join me. We're here in the San Francisco offices of Meadow. That's Have you right. ever been to Meadow before? I haven't. Thank you for the tour. Meadow built software for the industry, but it's got the most amazing group of people and it's in the most amazing space in San Francisco. This industry attracts really amazing people. Do you find that? Yeah. Well, everybody that I meet is just awesome and inspired and psyched to be a part of what the fastest growing industry in the history of the world. I've Are you read. a part of this industry in any way? Um, not officially, no, but. Um, I feel like it's kind of in the family. My cousin, who I grew up with and I'm very close to, whose name is Michael Steinmetz. He's the founder of Flocana, and Flocana is the, I guess they're kind of like the Whole Foods of cannabis. Oh, that's one they're way of the putting it. I never thought organic, of that. Organic, sun-grown, sun artisanal, craft beer strains. version of weed. Heritage strains, yeah. right? Yeah, like know your farmer, know where it came from, know how it was made. You know, and I think that we definitely know that there's a an increasingly discerning market of cannabis users who want to be sure they're using like an organic product. Is that you? Are you one of those people? I definitely like to be, I like to know what I'm ingesting. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm psyched to see cannabis become a wellness product. I'm psyched to see it come out of yeah. the closet to be demystified for us to know the science, know all the benefits of CBD and THC and, and, you know, the endocannabinoid system and how many of us are walking around with a deficiency in our endocannabinoid system, which might account for a lot of the pathologies of anxiety and depression that people have. But um, I think it does. Yeah. I yeah. absolutely think it yeah, does. Yeah, exactly. So I, I, I'm psyched seeing this being increasingly um, scientifically curated. That's okay. that's what I liked. I like to see the, this percentage of this and this percentage of that. You go to the dispensaries now, and it really does feel like you're in an Apple store of cannabis. Who would have thought that a psychoactive product would go mainstream and would come under you know sort of the scrutiny of capitalism, but in 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 the best sense, right? Who would have thought? Who would have guessed that it ever that it hasn't been for so long? I know, crazy. Because of our sort of crazy values and ethics and, you know, how you can marginalize yeah. a people and a plant. Isn't it crazy to think about a plant being marginalized? Yeah, well, I mean, prohibition goes beyond the bounds of reason by making a crime out of things that are not crimes, right? Isn't that what John Stuart Mill said uh, on liberty? Um, you can't really legislate a man's appetite. As long as somebody's not hurting anybody else, I think that over his own mind and body, to quote this guy, the individual is yes. sovereign. He's a good guy to quote, by the way. Yeah, I mean, I remember even in high school writing articles about cannabis legalization. Did you really? For, like debate class. What's your cannabis, do you have a regime of cannabis use or how do you like to use it in specific situations and avoid others? Those are two questions. Well, I remember when I was in high school, 
and I went to an international school in Venezuela. So I had, you know, friends, classmates from all over the world, which brought their various drug habits from all over the world. Oh, did so, they? You know, yeah. And so a lot of my friends started smoking pot in middle school and high school. Um, and I was uh, sort of staunchly anti-drugs in the beginning or anti-anything that seemed on the fringe. But uh, eventually I did a bunch of research and read like every book about cannabis. I remember a book called Mar Marijuana Myths, Marijuana Facts. That's right. That, one. that was a good one, yeah. And then From Chocolate to Morphine was another book that I read. I read all these too. Yeah, and then I wrote an article for my high school newspaper in which I had seen the way, and I sort of talked about, based on my research, how cannabis had been demonized. And I was, after I did my research, I felt like, okay, this ticks all my boxes as something that's non-toxic. It's not going to give you lung cancer or emphysema because I had an issue with anything related to smoking because my grandfather was a cigarette smoker and he died from complications from emphysema. So I already had like hypochondriacal issues related to anything that could affect my lungs. But eventually after a significant amount of reading, my curiosity was piqued. And I remember the first time I tried cannabis was with my father. Really? That's good. Yeah. What's your background? Like, you mean, what did you study? Did, yeah. you, what the did you study anything? <laughs> yes. I, I have a double major in yeah. philosophy and film from the University of Miami. The August Institution itself. The what institution? The August Institution. But you're very, you read a lot. You, I do read do a lot. Like and read, and my, my mother teaches high school literature and has for 40 years. So. And she's a 1960s kid. So she's like a poet and an artist and a psychedelic sculptor. And I grew up around poetry and music and her Terrence McKenna books and her Timothy Leary books. And I've just always been really curious. Um, and I think curiosity and anxiety are related. That's the thing. You know, we, we demonize anxiety because many people have pathological anxiety or don't know how to direct their anxious energy. But in many ways, like anxiety is also the cosmic restlessness that makes us go out and explore. It's what pushes us to transcend ourselves and our boundaries and so if we could only like direct anxiety in 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 ways that are positive we would come to realize that it can also be our friend a you know i so i have been an existentialist since i was a child i remember sitting in the bathtub you know at i don't know six years old seven years old or something and 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 first talking to my mother about death and you know ever since then the the <laughs> The despair around human mortality has, has haunted me, but it has also probably pushed me to make media and content and voraciously consume books and do my best to make sense of things, you know? That's ultimately what I'm interested in. I want to cultivate experiences of rapture, rhapsody, and wonder, and then I want to tile them with language. This is what I'm about. This is what this is what I need. This is what I breathe. You're amazing. I think of you as like a wonder junkie. Do you call yourself a hundred percent, man? And that was a term coined by Carl Sagan, who's one of my heroes. Ah, uh, mine and, too. And Carl Sagan was a total cannabis connoisseur, man. Loved it. He loved cannabis. And to be honest, you know the Cheech and Chong stereotypes of cannabis, I think, are so ex like just overdue for an upgrade. And I think the new poster child, like for the kind of cannabis consciousness that is worth celebrating like a cannabis as a tool for wellness as an agitator for wonder as a stimulator of creativity is somebody like Carl, Carl Sagan. Sagan because when he co talked about the cosmos the feeling of reverential awe and cosmological wonder it, it, for me I get off on hearing him talk it's cognitive ecstasy for me and then to find out that he used to love to get high with his wife, right? The, 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 the face of Cosmos. He used to love smoking pot with his wife. I'm telling you, right then and there, to me that sums up Complete. what cannabis can potentiate and the types of minds in many ways that, 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 that are attracted to the mildly intoxicating effects of, of, a, of a plant that has been used in sacred rituals for thousands of years for its capacity to engender the sacred and catapult us into a realm of the divine or a realm of the poetic or the platonic realm, so to speak. I mean, this is what David Lenson wrote in his book on yeah. drugs. I mean, it's all about how do we, he says, he says, cannabis fuses cognition and dream and cannabis makes objects stand more clearly for all of their class, right? So a landscape, a particular landscape looks like a landscape 
painting. You know, a particular vista looks like the archetype of what a vista is. A mystical beach becomes the archetype of what is mystical in the world. Beachness. And so you enter what he calls, it archetypalizes experience. Both Michael Pollan and David Lenson have said this. And so if you are interested in thinkers like Joseph Campbell, yeah. well, as I am, and his whole motif of the hero's journey, of mythologizing our lives, of the importance of living, of living a mythological narrative, then any token, any tonic that facilitates entry into the archetypical archetypal realm is going to be useful for meditation, for contemplation, for what F. Scott Fitzgerald refers to as a transitory enchanted moment in which man can hold his breath, compelled into an aesthetic contemplation he neither understood nor desired, face to face with something can measure it to his capacity for wonder. And I'm just like, I read that and I'm like, holy fucking goddamn shit. Like, that's the space that I want to live. I want to live in an enchanted world. I want to encounter things that are commensurate to my capacity for wonder. I want holy moments. I want time dilating and time stopping encounters that are so beautiful that I move to tears, right? Life should be lived to the point of tears. That's what Albert Camus said. If not that, then what the fuck else? What would you have to look forward to? Aging and dying? Do you know what I mean? So Do I know what you mean? <laughs> okay, let's talk about the amount of quotes you store in your brain. Well, what kind of recognition is this that you have? <laughs> I would say that language, you know, there's that line by Terence McKenna. I'll use a quote to Go justify on, why I remember quote. quotes. Yeah. He says, the world is made of words. And if you know the words the world is made of, you can make of it whatever you wish. I truly believe in the notion of language as something not, not just descriptive, but generative. And so even the words you use to map your experience can inform your experience. This is something you also become privy to, uh, whether you're microdosing or trying cannabis, is you become aware of the feedback loops between your creative and linguistic choices and your consciousness. Yes. Rich Doyle wrote about this in his book, Darwin's Pharmacy, Sex, ah. Plants, and the Evolution of the Neosphere. And I interviewed him once and it blew my mind. But essentially, when you play a song you love and you play a piece of music, if you were aware, if you were paying attention to the subtleties if how your creative and linguistic choices affects your experience, you would realize that all you have to do to change your state is put on a different song. You like you put a beautiful classical music and you feel a certain way. You put a different song and you feel differently. And you're like, oh my God, I have a capacity to affect my own consciousness. Really? <laughs> I can actually DJ my own experience, right? I'm a phenomenologist. I can DJ my own subjective state, right? What Eric Davis calls the evanescent flux of sensation and perception that is all we have and all we are. And if I can steward the contents of my consciousness, if I can steward my internal life, if I can pilot that evanescent flux of sensation and perception that is all I have and all I am, then the magic carpet ride is a reality construction that I can steer, right? That, that, that phenomenology is something we have agency over. And so what does that mean? It means you control reality. And so language is another tool that you can deploy for that because again, language beyond just description, language can be generative. So why, why do quotes matter? Why does writing matter? Because when you stumble upon something that's been exquisitely articulated and exquisitely rendered, right? Then that becomes an incantation as far as I'm concerned. So I recite, therefore I become. When I find the words to describe an experience, I'm cementing the experience, I'm archiving the experience, That's I'm right. making sense of the experience. I know what it means. I know what it is. You know, if I can't put it into language, it doesn't exist. Yeah, and you, so I think that when people say that ineffable experiences can't be languaged, certain psychedelic or mystical states can't be languaged, I think that is lazy. I refuse to believe it, you know? I, I think that's what art is for. Music, painting, cinema is about languaging ineffability. That's what we do. But interestingly, you told me you don't write, well, especially after this interview, I believe you, you don't write any scripts. No. You just start... And go. Well, yeah. And I mean, for but, minutes on end. Well, yeah. That's but an unusual I, thing. It, I'm interrupting you. It is, but it's, it's, it's towing the line between chaos and order because I'm also aware that one of the things that cannabis does is it, it's, a, it's a cognitive loosener, right? It's, yeah. it's a psycholytic. It's a mind loosener. And so you're going to start having increased pattern recognition. And so the training, the muscle, just like a surfer has to train to, sur to surf the waves, you know, is to be able to... Find, you know, what, what, what is uh, 
this guy, Rich Doyle, says, summon coherence in the bardos between one mm. statement and another. <laughs> but think about what's going on there. So you're, 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 it's no different than when a college professor you know, starts a class by saying, okay, Flaubert wrote that human speech is but a cracked kettle in which we tap crude rhythms while we long to make music that will melt the stars. What does that mean to you, kids? So I, I do that, that's what I do with myself. I'll say a quote, I'll recite a quote, and then in the recitation, as I recite, therefore I become. I'm sensitive to language, so I recite a quote like that, and then I feel enraptured by its rhapsody, right? I'm like, oh my God, that's exactly right. That's the feeling, right? I want to, to communicate something, and sometimes we struggle with it. You know, If you can't speak, you do it with music. If you can't do it with music, you do it with painting. But why, why, why? Because of the fire in our belly that longs to make music that will melt the stars. So the quote creates a butterfly effect in thought and a butterfly effect in free associations. And so the muscle there is to have the, you know, to, to grab all those flowing ideas and summon coherence and bring them together. And so that's the control freak. You know, people always say like, you, you have to learn to let go. I'm like, yeah, but what I do is controlled surrender. I let go, but I still pay attention. Because if there's no functional output, if I can't put language around what's happening, then it's just something that can be I don't know. I think it limits the experience. You don't write, though. Do you write? No, no, I can't write as fast as I talk. So do you use tape recorder? Do you do you? I want, make do videos. Do you capture things, or you just use videos as your diary, basically? Videos are my diary, yeah, yeah. My videos are journal. Well, they're very my, beautiful, they're I have journaling. to say. No, they're amazing. Thanks, bro. They are amazing. Thanks. How do you make a living? Uh, well, I've worked for 12 years as a TV personality. I know that. I, uh... My career started as a host on Current, which was Al Gore's yes. cable network. Yes. So my first gig out of film school uh, was to move to Los Angeles and host a show on this network, which I did for five years. It was cool because I had a nice calling card. I'm like, I work for Al Gore's Come on. cable channel, dude. Not bad. It was a fresh way to like hit up LA and like, you know, party and meet people and schmooze and network and have talking something to talk about in in cocktail parties. But it was also a good place to get my feet wet. And after five years with them. I took a year off and then I started making my videos, which I call Shots of Awe. And we can talk about awe in a bit because that's like the, we must. the emotion that matters the most. Yeah. But anyway, um, most. I started making these videos, which I at first self-funded. And very quickly thereafter, through a series of wildly fateful incidents, I met a showrunner who was doing a show called Brain Games. And a couple weeks later, he reached out to me. He was like, we're looking for a host for the show. I sent him some of the videos I was doing. He was like, you're awesome. Let's show this to the big brass at Nat Geo. And then they offered me the hosting gig for Brain Games, which was on brand, I guess you could say, for somebody who cares about the like brain. neuroscience and thinking. Cognitive cognition. That show was nominated for an Emmy. I was nominated for an Emmy for being the host of the show. Uh, five seasons we did. 171 countries of distribution. So I guess you could say it gave me a big platform. I would say. And, you know, kept doing my videos on the side, partnered with Discovery Digital Networks for those. Uh, my friend Tom Lofthouse, who was the VP of programming there, really understood my creative process with the videos. He knew the videos were essentially my integration sessions from an altered state of reverie and that the videos were reflections of what I had induced before. So he understood that the preparation for the videos wasn't to script them, it was to go have a really meaningful rhapsodic experience, potentially mediated by cannabis, and then re record, <laughs> what, record what came out later. And that's but but how, cannabis was an integral part of this experience. It's been an integral part of all my creative work. Amazing. Yeah, like, like Sagan. You know, I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know it was that integral to what you do. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it, for me it's like a sacred, medicine man because it's 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 pointed the way uh i mean you could say that it just revealed me to myself yes. that's what bob marley used to say yeah, nice. so maybe that was that was all me but it definitely i i i, I owe it a lot huh yeah so what's your diet how do you use it do you use it in a particularly unique way to you that you've yeah i mean I, i'm a lover of the idea of experience design. So yes. I, I, I need to curate and design uh, experiences that will unfold over time. So several hours, novelty is very important, 
the company you keep is very important. You become what you behold. You are the sum of the people you hang out with. The feedback loops between yourself, the environment, and the person that you're with get highly amplified. You become mm -hmm. aware of those feedback loops. You become hyper aware of how this person is making you feel, how this landscape is making you feel. And all those loops are very important to, to control beforehand. You know, who yes. are you going to be with, where are you going to be? So as long as I take those boxes, in places like Amsterdam, beautiful European cities that I can like ride my bike in magical places, anything that facilitates entry, entry into the enchanted state, entry into the trance state. And if you tick all those boxes, then I think it's an art, by the way. It's more than a science. By the way. The, the, the art of curating your cannabis trips. Um, but so once those boxes are ticked, and I, I know I'm not a daily user, I never have been, because, um, well, first of all, not every day provides that. the space in the context that I require because I'm kind of a snob as to where and when. Love that. Um, and I have no issue with not partaking for weeks or even months if I'm busy doing other stuff and if the environment is just not there. Um, but when it is, whether it was uh, on safari in South Africa or riding electronic bicycles through Copenhagen, um, I would say that the experiences that become the reference point for the most meaningful ex experiences of my life have, have always come through that. Yeah. So, do you use edibles? Do you smoke? Do you have a different? I like the uh, delivery uh, portable. Method? The portable vapes are my favorite. Oh, really? I, I would say so the, simple, the, huh? the dosist pens. Yeah. I just because there's just clean. It's simple. There's no combustion. You don't have to worry about the wind. You don't have to worry about changing the capsule. So you like the ease of it, dude. You do. I'm all about convenience, man. I wanted you to experience this. I understand you've had your fill today, but I did want you to experience this really special infused honey. I know a maker hmm. in Southern California who prefers not to be known, who manages to mix these special herbs like frankincense, different herbs that she collects throughout the world hmm. with cannabinoids in a honey that you take a tiny you know, match head size of that is a very lyrical, for me, very lyrical sort of experience. So I wanted to share it with you, but I understand you've hit your dose today. Um, yeah. But it's very interesting for me to try those sorts of products. I'm meeting with somebody else. In, How uh, long does something like that take to uh, take Go effect? through the system? Oh, yeah. it takes effect within 10 minutes, okay. and it lasts for about an hour. So it's, it's in and out. Mm. I like the quick hit because mm -hmm. you can then you know, sort of manage what you're doing, mm -hmm. right? You don't have to what, wait. I mean, for you, what is your... What is your appropriate dose? And, and, and you know, I, I go back and forth on this and whether I think strains can determine your experience or whether, let's not kid ourselves here, we're talking psychoactives and yep. psychoactives are determined primarily by set and setting because they're essentially yes, but these are placebos plants. with booster rockets. No, because the reason I ask is because the control freak in me wants to always have the kind of high that I want. Always. And so I wish there was a strain called Wonder. Well, and I wish there was a strain called Laughing Fit. Let me and introduce that, you, know, you one day to something called In the Pines. You told me about that. In the Pines to me is a... Cons and also Hua, who runs Meadow, loves Red Congo. Red Congo is like, it's his mantra, okay. okay? And it's grown here in San Francisco, in okay. the city, okay? And it is a beautiful thing, I have to say. So, again, because I don't live in California, I don't get access to these things consistently, but when I've had them, they do consistently deliver the experience because of those high, they're very high in certain terps, certain I mean, terpenes, well, do right? You, do you remember American Beauty, the movie? Vaguely, yeah, I remember uh, Kevin Spacey. Yeah, so when that film first came out and that scene where he first buys pot from yes. Richie yeah. and Richie's like, this is special government engineer G13, no paranoia, a totally mellow high. And the guy, could, and Kevin Spacey could smoke like all these joints from it. And it was like, and I remember at the time, that was like over 10 years ago, but at the time I was like, does that exist? No paranoia guarantee? No, it's certainly not from the US government. It doesn't, that's for sure. But that, I that idea. But I think that dose idea, is, I'm look, as I've, gotten older in years my dose tolerance has changed dramatically yeah. right when i was younger it was like bup, 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 all the thing all the time not anymore at all i'm very much like you i like to control the experience i like yeah. to know what i'm doing i like to direct it i like to well you know we have a certain control quality about us but i like these i love these sort of newer products that are mixing different 
herbs and nutraceuticals together sure. with cannabinoids yeah. because I think that's really interesting. Yeah, and also let's not talk about the let's not forget the non psychoactive stuff like yeah. CBD. You know, I, I know love it. So many people who just like have not have stopped taking Xanax and just take and CBD and pills. It mellows them out. Yeah, it I helps all you these sleep, friends. Right? I, for the, all these friends, like okay, again, yeah. it's like past forty and tell me you're not going to have sleep issues. Something mm. just happens. Yeah. Okay, yeah. just happens. Life is active, yeah. and the brain can't process. I don't know. Yeah. Wake you wake up anyway. I have given CBD to so many friends who ask me. They think I'm a miracle worker. It puts them to bed, huh? It puts them to sleep. How many milligrams? Twenty. Yeah. Twenty. We get it from the, a company called Green um, Level Blends. Makes these pro tabs that are twenty-five milligram CBD capsules, and yeah. I mean, I'm meeting with a maker. But that, you don't feel drowsy on it or anything. No, like you that, don't. You right? wake up quite clear. I'm, I'm working, me, working meeting with somebody this week up in um, up in Santa Rosa, near Santa Rosa. Sebastopol, who's an herbalist, a trained herbalist, and he also makes these very interesting potions. So when you're mixing certain certain types of cannabinoids with, I don't know, valerian root or some of the other traditional sort of sleep medicines, I think that's really the future. Let's talk about wellness and cannabis. Let's also talk about awe, but let's talk about wellness first. Yeah, well... I mean, I just think it's um, it's very exciting to see a plant that has so many uses, you know, go mainstream. And I'm fascinated by seeing an increasingly discerning kind of connoisseur consumer yeah. who's like getting really excited about their potions and their tokens and how much CBD and how much terpenes. And it's just nice to finally move beyond the stigma of like it's drugs it's just drugs man you're doing drugs you know because they used to always i remember reading this whole thing about like how they trick you in the phrasing of the sentence you know like they would say you know everybody that becomes a cocaine addict started with pot pot and you say the statement like that and it sounds like whoa so that means that pot causes you to become a cocaine, cocaine addict. addict but if you flip it around and you say well how many people who smoke pot actually move on to do cocaine and it's almost nothing <laughs> what did i do i just flipped the sentence you, you know the, yeah. so these trickeries of language have always been used to scare people um about these substances and also grouping anything as a drug, drug, you know, from like cocaine and crack and meth to like, you know, sacred mushrooms used in indigenous cultures or a plant that was used by Bob Marley to write beautiful music about coming together. You know, there's a great book by Ronald Siegel called Intoxication, Amazing Life in book. Pursuit of Artificial Paradise. And I remember reading that even in high school. And he explained that the desire to alter our consciousness is part of what it means to be human. Whether you're a little child spinning yourself into a frenzy or a blissful state, or you're a lover having sex with your with your lady you know or your guy or whether you're using this herb to make you giggle go to sleep and ponder the cosmos why this terror why this fear of intoxication and i think you know i think the answer probably lies more in the fact that um david lenson gets into this is uh is that cannabis <laughs> used to seem like it was incompatible with capitalism yes. you know because if people, if people were getting high you know they were kind of having a good time in their garden and they realized they didn't have to buy every toy that was on the market and you know they could like send themselves out and this and that but i guess california is showing that cannabis works beautifully with, with cannabis. Ca yeah. <laughs> so it's actually we found the best of both worlds it doesn't make you lazy it makes you ambitious <laughs> um but you know ultimately what we're talking about here is you know if you're want to partake in an intoxicant, in a medicine that has a thousand proven benefits, you're not hurting anybody else, you're of age, and you're doing it responsibly, that is what freedom looks like, you know? Amen, and period to that, period. right? Yeah, so. But you think awe is one of the more uh, heightened states of being? Yeah, well, I mean, that's the thing, right? <laughs> um, I believe that being alive is also to be terrified about the fact that you are a mortal being. This is what um, Ernest Becker wrote about in his brilliant book, The Denial of Death. He says that the, 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 the worm at the core of our depression and anxiety and Mortality. epidemic level is is just the incongruency of mortal beings who dream of immortality i mean we 
we, we rhapsodize and dream about exploring the cosmos, man, yet you're a breathing piece of defecating meat destined to die and ultimately no more significant than a lizard or a potato. How do you reconcile the fact that we build space telescopes that mainline space and time through the optic nerve with the fact that we're like aging, rotting, you know, like it's, it's really fucked up, right? And so there's two things we can do in the meantime, right? On the one hand, with our creativity, we constantly overcome our limits, which offers us a kind of symbolic transcendence of the mortal coil. Everything that we do that overcomes obstacles from airplanes that transcend gravity to smartphones that transcend space and time and distance, you know, like our tools are forms of divine engineering that show that our aspirations are more than mortal. And eventually we'll turn those tools inside of ourselves and start reprogramming biology with biotech and genetics and synthetic biology and all that jazz. And that's really when we'll start taking control of our own evolutionary destiny and hopefully transcend mortality itself. I'm a totally into transhumanism. But in the meantime, if in case we fail, you know, how do we <laughs> how do we keep ourselves, you know, inspired? And the only way to do that is to forget ourselves, right? And to yeah. forget ourselves requires to encounter something that is that exceeds our mental modelings of reality. Because the brain is always modeling reality. The brain is storing a model of the world. That's how you navigate with the world. It gives you the algorithms to mediate your encounters with the world. But occasionally you see something, you come across something that is outside of your models of reference, outside of your frames of reference. And when that happens, right, you're forced to accommodate yourself to this new experience. And in that accommodation to this thing that was outside your frames of reference, you experience an exhilarating neurostorm of intense intellectual pleasure we call awe. And awe is a transitory enchanted moment, but it is enough to fill us with grace, to fill us with rhapsody, to fill us with gratitude, to heal our fucking wounds, and ultimately to leave us with lasting cognitive benefits like increasing well-being, increased compassion, and increased creativity. You think so? So awe is therapeutic. Oh, I don't think so. This is out of studies out of Berkeley and Stanford and other places that have looked at the cognitive benefits of awe. So any tool that facilitates having encounters with awe and cannabis is one of those tools because, again, cannabis blocks all signals forwards and backwards. So because of that, it makes it easier to have an experience for which you have no reference. Because partly if it's a new experience, great. But also if you're high and you have those signals forwards and backwards blocked, you're going to have the experience as if it's new. You're going to have the virginal noticing that Michael Pollan talks about. And that's where things get interesting, you know. How do we combine landscapes? How do we combine novelty? How do we combine beautiful works of art with tools like cannabis? You know, what's the movie, the movie theater of the future in California? It's one where you, you know, you screen 2001 A Space Odyssey and you put little vaporizers next to the seats and you make a cannabis friendly cinema. I mean, it's the new surround sound is going to be THC mm, sound. That's you know, really good. That stuff is, you know, it's interesting to see the new creative playgrounds and forms of cognitive play that are going to be deployed to, um, to combine with cannabis consciousness in a world of legalization, you know? I was always wondering before meeting you, if you ever had an idea or a, a, a desire to start sort of a wonder camp <laughs> where people come for a period of time to explore different ways of using cognition, essentially, not yeah. only through cannabis, but other things, too. Um, well, that would be awesome. I've always, I've always wanted to do uh, guided hikes, cannabis hikes. How nice. cool would that be? You where know? would you do it? I don't know. Somewhere beautiful. And overwhelming. <laughs> Where do you live? I'm pretty nomadic these days. Um, I kind of go, I do a lot of speaking engagements about innovation and tech, and I do a lot of video stuff, and I'm kind of a novelty whore, so I get bored every two or three weeks. I got to go somewhere else. But I spend my time between San Francisco, New York, Miami, and Amsterdam primarily. Primarily? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And do you find that you have to have groups of friends in all of those places? I do. They're like family now in all those places. So it's funny. I land in any of those cities and it's like I'm at home. Nice. It's good and bad. What's the bad part? Uh, that you never feel like you're fully 100% comfortable anywhere. You're always on the move. Yeah, well, you're comfortable for like a little while, but you're living out of a suitcase. Do you like being a guest? Um, I don't know. Sometimes. I think right now if you put those things and you weigh them against each other... Obviously, I still prefer the novelty and the adventure and the feeling of being a band on tour and my feet never touching the ground. Yeah. And I'm still on that high. Um, but more and more, I occasionally feel the desire to, to ground myself somewhere. I just haven't decided. Where, who, when? I don't know. 
Got it. What are you reading now? What am I reading? Well, I just finished Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind. Did you enjoy it? I loved it. He's great. He's great because he he has the experience but retains a healthy skepticism. Yes. He's open-minded, but he doesn't ever drink the Kool-Aid. Yes. And that's... Necessary. That reminds me of me. <laughs> you know, like I, 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 I don't like the overzealous, overzealotry of, of many people about, um, you know, what these experiences mean, particularly in, in terms of the psychedelic psychotherapy. People have a mystical experience and they're like, you know, I realize that death is an illusion. And I'm like, no, I'm happy you had a, a, a poetic realization that made you at peace with the fact that you are mortal and that gave you a story that you're comfortable with and that healed you. That's what matters. Did you glimpse objective truth? No way to know. But I don't, I don't think you did. You know, it's, I think psychedelic experiences have been shown to be way too constructed to show you anything objective about reality. Mm. You know, indigenous cultures see mm. the lady ayahuasca vine, you know, and the snakes and Christian cultures will see Christ, you know, people have religious experiences, will have different wallpaper depending on their interpretive frameworks and their culture. And I think what that tells you is that none of their stories are objectively real. Yeah. It's one thing I like about you and also in the work of Jamie Wheel. I love Jamie Wheel. In that it, 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 it talks about this stuff, but it's completely apart from religion. Yeah. And sort of deconstructs the idea of spiritual as well, which is important to me. Yeah. How do you feel about that? Do you consider yourself a spiritual person? No, I consider myself a person who is uh, <laughs> like starved for the kind of spiritual experiences that would heal me of my existential dread. <laughs> and I only find temporarily, temporary respite from that dread, but nothing yet that carries over into my baseline scrutiny. Gotta think about that. So far, all the healing moments are transitory enchanted moments. I haven't found the infinite enchanted moment yet. Ah, oh, the infinite. I was looking for a lot, Jason. I know. You have a great smile. Thanks, bro. I'm glad you came to talk to me today. Thank you, man. Thank you for having me. Thanks for calling. Thank me. you for doing Anytime. what you're doing. Thank Anytime. you. Anytime. Anytime. Awesome. I wanna I wanna talk more about designer experiences and wonder and all. This is yeah. Sort of where life has taken me. It's groovy stuff, man. It's crazy. I yes, can't believe sir. I have somebody else to talk about it with actively and sensibly. Thanks Rock again. Thank you. Thank, thank you. thank you. Thank you. Hi, listeners. We are always on the lookout for great things to talk about on the Brave New Weed podcast, and we'd love to hear from you. You can always email us at bravenewweedcast at gmail.com with links to articles, interesting news stories, personal accounts of things that you've done, or leads on books or products that we should know about. You can always contact us at bravenewweedcast at gmail.com. So, Jason, Silva, thanks for joining me. Um, it always amazes me how you speak in paragraphs, in pages, not in sentences. It's, it's very impressive. Yeah. You've, got, you've got quite a skill, and I'm not really sure how you channel it, but but keep going. Um, yeah, I really wish I could have been a part of that, Joe. Um, it, you know, I'm, I've been a fan for a long time. So. Well, it's hard to catch him. Uh, he, he is a, a man who flies all the time. I'm sure he lives um, in a plane. And it's hard to connect with him in, in one physical space. So I'm really fortunate that we were able to be in San Francisco together. And as I mentioned Indeed. at the top of this episode, our next episode is going to be an interview with Mitch o. Thompson, who's an incredible herbalist and um, uh, sort of a, a, an alchemist, if you will. Um, I, don't, I don't mean that in the, in, in the negative way. I mean that in the positive way. He's able to blend cannabinoids with tinctures and oils of various herbs and, and create some pretty astounding effects. Um, I, I, and as I said, I think this is a way to the future. And he'll really tell us what he does, how he does it, how he developed it in the next episode of the Brave New Weed cast. So, so please come back. Please listen. And please consider supporting us if you like what we're doing. Thanks again for joining. Thanks for listening to the Brave New Weed Podcast. This episode and all future episodes are made possible by amazing listeners like yourself. If you like what you've heard, we encourage you to show your support 
by giving $1 a month for special access and rewards on patreon.com slash brave new weed. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram via at brave new weed. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash brave new weed. And remember, you can always find more information about us or information discussed in each episode by pointing your favorite browser to bravenewweed.com.